So this class, we're going to um, basically finish up the BOD measurement and also talk about the DO SAG curve, okay? Uh, so again, the reading assignment is going to be 9-2 and 9-3 of the uh, textbook, okay? So again, for a recap, um, so last class we discussed what is an oxygen demand and dissolved oxygen, right? And then we further um, discussed what are the differences among the theoretical oxygen demand, the chemical oxygen demand, and biochemical oxygen demand. So basically for these three, uh, we said that under very rare circumstances, these two are going to be, each other, be equal to each other, right? But under no circumstance, the BOD is going to be equal to these two, mainly because uh, should be the reverse, mainly because some of the carbon species, they are getting converted into a part of the microorganisms, right? So not all of them are getting decomposed into carbon dioxide. So some of them are just transitioned into a part of their body. So we also uh, gave the equation to describe what is the BOD as a function of time. So we draw the, uh, basically the time series of the for example, the organics, right? So the organics are going to decrease exponentially, mainly because the bacteria are going to consume them, right? So the BOD is just a reciprocal of the um, organics, right? It's going to follow this trend here. So this is the BOD. So it has the equation of L0 multiplied by one minus exponential of minus KT. So further this L0, is the ultimate BOD, right? And we also discussed how this K value here, this rate constant, depend on the temperature, all right? Um, so basically, uh, the higher the temperature, the larger the K, right? Basically, the more, the faster the decomposition. And then further, we give out that um, if we know what is the rate constant at one temperature, let's say if we know what is happening at time, uh, temperature of one, basically T1, then we can just use this equation to convert it into uh, K2, right? So this is the equation that we can use. Um, so let's just continue our discussion on the measurement of the BOD. So last class, we just talked about the first step, which is to uh, take the water sample and then fill it into a bottle, basically a sample bottle that has certain volume in here. All right, so the first step is to basically dilute the sample. So the major reason for that is um, for a lot of the wastewater treatment facility, let's say, or the, in the wastewater, it's going to have a very large BOD, let's say 100 milligram per liter of the BOD, okay? So if it has this large of a BOD, there's no way we can measure it by just throwing in uh, microorganisms inside. This is mainly because if we have a bottle, and this is, uh, we have these all of these organics inside, okay? And then we also throw in these um, bacteria. So the major problem is that the dissolved oxygen in the bottle is limited, okay? So the dissolved oxygen at maximum is 8.5 milligram per liter, okay? So this is determined by the, um, basically the pressure of the oxygen is determined by the nature. There's no way we can put in more oxygen inside the bottle. So under this situation, if, it, if the wastewater has a very large BOD, then what that means is that if we plot out the dissolved oxygen concentration, then it's just going to decrease and hit zero, right? So there's no way we can measure the change of the, of the dissolved oxygen. So what we should do is we should dilute this sample, dilute it into a manageable concentration so that we can see the dissolved oxygen goes like this. So in this way, we can measure what is a change of the dissolved oxygen and then to calculate what is a BOD, right? So th that's why we have to do this dilution process. And because of this dilution, people defined uh, these parameter that's called the sample size or the dilution factor. So basically, uh, 
we'll use P as a uh, symbol for this dilution factor. So basically this is just the volume of the undiluted sample divided by the volume of the diluted sample, okay? So for example, if we have this, uh, again, have this uh, uh, wastewater here, 100 milligram per liter of the wastewater. So what we can do is that we can take three milliliter of the wastewater and then put it into this 300 milliliter bottle. So the rest of them is just pure water. It's ultra pure water that doesn't have any organics inside. So now if we calculate what is the BOD in this mixture bottle here, right? So then that's going to be 300 multiplied by the BOD. That's it, mixed. It's going to be equal to three multiplied by 100, right? And then we know that the rest of them, 297 milliliter, doesn't have any BOD inside because it's ultra, ultra pure water. So because of that, the BOD of the mixture is just going to be one milligram per liter, okay? So this is the reason why we want to dilute it. After, we, after the dilution, we can make the BOD to be a manageable value so that we can determine what is the change of the dissolved oxygen concentration, okay? So then uh, we're going to have this quiz question again. So uh, last class, I think there were some misconceptions um, and uh, I gave this question twice, but uh, I didn't see that uh, most of you get the correct answer. So maybe we can spend one minute to uh, look at this problem again. And what I'll do this time is I'll break up, uh, set up some breakout rooms. Okay, so welcome back. So I also launched this quiz question again. I'm seeing that this time, most of you are getting the correct answer. Okay, I think we can just stop here. Yeah, so it should be 10 milligram per liter. Okay, so that's the reason why we need to dilute it. So uh, basically uh, it's because the wastewater sample is too, uh, too polluted, right? So there's no way we can um, measure the BOD with that sample as is, right? So we have to add in some purified water to make the concentration of the organics lower so that uh, we can measure a change in the dissolved oxygen. Otherwise, it's always going to be around 8.5, right? All of the oxygen are depleted. So this is the reason why we need to do the first step, that is the dilution, right? And then the second step is to add in those bacteria into the sampled bottle. Okay, so let's say we draw this bottle again. Uh, what we do is we'll add in, let's say one milliliter of the bacteria or several milliliters of it. But at the same time, uh, what people will do is they will set up a blank to estimate the oxygen that's consumed by the bacteria themselves. So the reason for that is, let's say we add in one milliliter of the bacteria inside, okay? And what we see is that uh, the uh, dissolved oxygen, let's say after five days, the dissolved oxygen dropped from eight this is DO, this is time, dropped from eight to three. Okay, so this is a sample bottle. So the reason why we want to set up this blank or the control group is that we know the bacteria, even without any organics, they're still going to consume oxygen, right? On one hand, there may be some food that's stored in their body, right? So they have to consume oxygen. But at the same time, if there's no food, um, although it sound might, might be brutal, but they can consume each other, right? So that's going also going to consume the oxygen. So because of that, let's say if we just set up a, uh, a control bottle, which doesn't have any organics inside, it's just purified water. And then we add in these uh, inoculum or the bacteria inside. So what we can see is that the oxygen is still going to decrease let's say from eight to 7.5, okay? So when we calculate the BOD um, uh, within this bottle, we definitely want to exclude this 0.5 of the uh, dissolved oxygen change because this happens just to the bacteria, not to the organics inside, right? So what happens is that we're going to just calculate the difference in here. 
So the way to do that is basically eight minus three. That is the change of the uh, dissolved oxygen in the sample bottle. And then we will minus eight minus 7.5, which is the change of the dissolved oxygen in the control bottle. This is sample bottle, right? So that's where we want to set up this bottle to get basically more accurate results in the BOD. So the third step is to uh, incubate the bottles under dark at 20 Celsius. Uh, I think this is what you did in your experiments, right? So the reason to do it in dark is, um, who knows, there may be some photosynthesizing bacteria inside. So maybe they can sustain themselves in the bottle, but definitely we don't want to see that. We just want to evaluate what is the concentration of the organics, right? Or the, the BOD here. So normally people will use five days. Right? That's why you heard the word BOD five. So in your experiments, you also have BOD seven or BOD three. So these are the measurements or the time that people will use. And then we can use the BOD T equal to L zero, one minus exponential minus KT to calculate what is the ultimate BOD, right? So this is the way we do the, uh, uh, the estimation. So basically BOD U, ultimate BOD. Um, so yeah, the, so the final step is to uh, um, basically do the calculation, right? So there are two ways to do it. So there's a simple one. So the simple one is that, let's say you don't have the control uh, group. If you don't have the control group, then you can only refer to the uh, change of the dissolved oxygen in the sample bottle. So basically what you're just seeing is uh, this decrease here, right? So that's going to be the dissolved oxygen at the beginning minus the dissolved oxygen at the end, right? And then uh, let's say if this is eight, this is three, then basically the BOD is calculated by eight minus three. And then the P here is the dilution factor, right? So earlier we had the dilution factor 0.5. So basically we just multiply that by two and we can get the BOD T is going to be 10, right? So this is a simple way. As we said, normally we want to include the control bottle. So what that means is that we need to minus the uh, oxygen that's consumed by the bacteria in here, right? So we mentioned that there are two bottles. So one bottle we add in, um, let's say one bottle we add in one milliliter of the bacteria and the other bottle we do the same, one milliliter, okay? But for some scenarios, there may be uh, conditions that we may add in 10 milliliter, mainly because bacteria consume oxygen too slow. Right, we want to put in more bacteria there to see a measurable change in the dissolved oxygen. So in that case, um, to accurately reflect the change of the dissolved oxygen in the sample bottle, we need to divide the change of the DO by 10, right? Because in here, we just put in one milliliter of the bacteria. So that's why we need to multiply this F factor here. So the F is basically the ratio of the seed or the bacteria in the diluted sample to the seed in the seed control, okay? So um, here we have a example problem. Um, so basically um, this is showing you two conditions, right? We can have the sample bottle and we can also have the uh, control bottle. So what happens in the sample bottle is that let's say we just put in three milliliter of the sample. Then what that means is the rest of the 297 milliliter it's just water, okay? It's very pure water here. And then we add in one milliliter of the seed or the bacteria. So what we found is that after five days, we see the dissolved oxygen decreased from eight to three, right? So if we do th with the simple way, then basically the BOD is going to be the delta DO divided by P, right? So that's DO initial minus DO final divided by P. So we have eight minus three. So the P here, the dilution ratio or the dilution factor is going to be three divided by 300, 
right? That's the sample volume divided by the bottle volume. So that's going to be 0 0.001, which is 500 milliliter, uh, milligram per liter, okay? So this is the BOD with the simple method. So if we use the, um, the more accurate method, then we need to consider the control condition, right? So in this control condition, uh, instead of adding in one milliliter of the seed, we added in two milliliter of the seed, right? And what we saw is that the DO decreased from 8.5 to 7.5. So basically the Delta DO in here in the control group just decreased by one milligram per liter, right? So if you reflect that into the sample bottle, then what that means is that um, basically we used half of the bacteria in the sample bottle, right? So the DO that's caused by the bacteria is going to be one multiplied by 0.5, which is 0.5 milligram per liter. This is the amount of DO consumed by the bacteria only, not by the organics, okay? So then um, what we need to do is we need to uh, use this eight minus three. This is the change of the DO in the sample bottle and then minus that 0.5. So this is caused by the bacteria. And then we'll divide everything by the P, which is 0 0.01. And you can find that this is 450 milligram per liter. Okay, so in here I have the uh, equation listed as well. So basically, what we do is we plug in the DO or the change of the DO in the sample bottle, and then we minus the dissolved oxygen that's consumed by the bacteria. And then this F factor just reflects the difference in the uh, bacteria, the amount of bacteria that we put into the bottle, okay? And then we divide everything by 0.01. And, and then it turns out that the accurate BOD is 450 milligram per liter which is a quite, um, which has a quite large difference compared to the simple method, right? So basically you uh, if you use a simple method, then you overestimate by around 10% in terms of the BOD. So that's why um, people would like to include these control groups to get more accurate BOD values, right? Um, so until now we have been discussing the, um, the, the BOD that's caused by the organics. And most of them are actually caused by the carbonaceous groups. We mentioned those are the hydrocarbons. So indeed the hydrocarbons are, you can treat it as simple sugar, right? It's very easy for the bacteria to use them. But um, there are scenarios, let's say the wastewater can contain a lot of nitrogenous species, basically the protein and uh, for example, some other organic content, uh, components that contain the oxygen, okay? So uh, whenever there is, when, when both protein and hydrocarbons coexist, the hydrocarbons are being consumed at the beginning. So um, normally the protein will be consumed later on, and also it needs a special group of the nitrifying bacteria. So it really depends on which water body we're talking about. For some locations, and the, these nitrifying bacteria may just doesn't, exi uh, doesn't exist at all, right? So basically they cannot use these protein species, but in some area, there are these uh, bacteria. So because of that, we need to uh, consider the BOD that's caused by the nitrogen as well, if there are these uh, nitrifying bacteria. So to do this uh, NBOD calculation, um, the only available equation to do is the theoretical, the theoretical method. You can treat it as theoretical NBOD, right? So what happens is that we just use this equation to calculate uh, the amount of uh, oxygen that's required for oxidizing the ammonia ion, okay? So the NBOD is defined as the grams of the oxygen that's used divided by the grams of the nitrogen uh, that's being oxidized. You see that the nitrogen here is oxidized into the nitric ion and also two protons, right? So uh, if we have this equation here, then we can see that the grams of oxygen used, that's just going to be two multiplied by 32, which is the molecular weight of the oxygen. 
And then we divide it by the uh, grams of the nitrogen oxidized, which is one multiplied by seven, uh, 14 grams per mole, okay? So um, with this equation, we can calculate that the NBOD is 4.57 grams of oxygen per grams of nitrogen. So this is a theoretical uh, NBOD. So again, similar to the um, chemical um, or the, the carbonaceous species, okay? So the BOD, um, actual BOD is slightly lower than this theoretical value, mainly because some of the nitrogen, they're converted into the bacteria body, right? So not all of them are going through this chemical reaction here. So uh, that's why the actual NBOD is lower uh, compared to this uh, equation here. So with these knowledge, uh, we can kind of uh, uh, try to understand how does a BOD change as a function of time, right? So uh, previously we mentioned that the BOD is reciprocal of the organics, right? As a function of time, this is L, this is BOD. So now if we consider the NBOD, then what happens is that for untreated sewage, uh, again, the BOD is going to increase, but at first it's just going to consume the CBOD because the hydrocarbons are very, very easy to consume for the bacteria. And it's only later on when most of these, uh, these um, uh, hydrocarbons are consumed, then these nitrifying bacteria are going to consume the nitrogen species and then further add in the BOD. So basically it's going to consume more oxygen in the wastewater, right? And then for the treated sewage, um, so what the uh, treated sewage does is Basically, it's the product from the wastewater treatment facility. So a lot, um, in a lot of the wastewater treatment facilities, there's no treatment of the nitrogen-containing nitrogen species. So basically, we don't have these uh, nitrifying bacteria. So that's why the NBOD are not treated uh, at all. If there are any, then it's just a small amount. So most of the treated BOD are the CBOD. So for the treated sewage, you can see that um, very quickly, we're reaching to the point where the CBOD are being consumed, okay? And then the, the bacteria are going to start to um, um, consume the NBOD here. So you see that for the untreated sewage and the treated sewage, the NBOD are very similar to each other. And this is mainly because the water treatment facility or the wastewater treatment facility, they, they don't have these nitrifying bacteria. It's very difficult to use them to treat these uh, protein containing species, okay? Uh, so, uh, but we're still dealing with, I would say most of the uh, hydrocarbon species. So you see what the difference looks like, right? So this is the untreated sewage and this is the treated sewage. So we're remo removing almost 60% uh, of them, right? 70% of the hydrocarbons, which is beneficial to the environment. Um, so, I would say that the knowledge on the BOD and dissolved oxygen or the DO is going to be very helpful when we are trying to understand or to study the water quality in rivers. And actually the water quality in river is a, a very important topic as you can see from your textbook, okay? So it um, occupies a large um, content there. And this is mainly because if you think about all the civilizations, all the big cities in history and also in, in modern cities. So most of these big cities are nearby rivers because of the transportation, right? And also because of the, uh, uh, the convenience for getting um, pure water, right? To support all the different types of activities. Uh, so that's why people spend a lot of efforts to understand how does the um, wastewater or how does the industry might pollute the river water. Uh, so you might say that, well, we're generating waste to the environment. So is there a way to manage this? Or uh, we're definitely doing some harm to the nature, right? Uh, it turns out that there are ways to mitigate this problem, and actually to reduce or minimize this impact. So uh, for example, I'm just giving, uh, throwing out an example that let's say that we are a manager of, a, uh, of an industry, right? Uh, so unfortunately, we have to um, generate a lot of wastewater. Of course, we want to keep everything clean, but it's almost impossible, okay? So let's say that 
we have this industry that has this discharge pipe that's feeding water into the Mississippi River, okay? And what happens is in this wastewater, um, it has a BOD value of 500 milligram per liter, which is quite high here, but there are more polluted industries, okay? Um, let's assume that we are discharging the wastewater as a flow rate of one meter cube per second, okay? And then at the same time, we can, what we can imagine that the DO in this wastewater is going to be very low. Uh, let's assume that the DO is zero, okay? It doesn't have any DO, any oxygen anymore in this water. So there's no way we can have any bacteria or, or living species in here. So this is almost dead water, okay? So what happens is that uh, we decided to um, discharge it into the Mississippi River. So, uh, so the Mississippi River, let's assume that it's very clean, although it's uh, normally not the case, but let's assume that the, the BOD is zero, okay? Which is very clean, doesn't contain any organics inside. And in terms of the flow rate, let's assume that it's a hundred meters uh, meter cubed per second, okay? So uh, this is going to be a simple physical mixing problem and we can calculate what is the BOD value after the water is mixed and what is the dissolved oxygen concentration after mixing, right? So this is uh, quite easy to do. So we can calculate that the BOD mix is going to be the flow rate of the wastewater multiplied by the BOD of the wastewater plus the flow rate of the river water multiplied by the BOD of the river water and then divide by QW plus QR, okay? So this is the way we can calculate the BOD in the mixture, right? So this turns out to be one multiplied by 500 plus zero multiplied by 100 and divide by 100, one plus 100, okay? So basically it's 500 divided by 101, which is around five milligram per liter. Okay, so you see that after we mix our polluted water into the Mississippi River, the BOD is just five milligram per liter. Okay, so we said that under saturated condition, the dissolved oxygen is around eight to 8.5 milligram per liter, right? So what that means is that even if we put in this amount of BOD, this amount of organics, we're still roughly having three to 3.5 milligram of the oxygen, right? So what is going to be the impact here? So we can try to use this, uh, this uh, figure to try to understand the process, okay? So basically after the wastewater is being discharged because of the organics or because of the bacteria, the dissolved oxygen, basically the oxygen concentration is going to decrease, right? And then it's going to reach to a minimum value here. So what happens to the, what this means to the uh, living organisms is that uh, because we have the clean water here, we can have a lot of different type of fish, higher level of organisms, right? Fish, insects, and so on. But because the oxygen are gone, these fish cannot live anymore. So basically they are gone. They cannot live in this water. But what happens is that we are still having some of these organisms, these photosynthesizing organisms or some bacteria inside, right? And then um, what happens is while the water is flowing or the river is flowing, there's always oxygen at the surface of the river, okay? So according to the Henry's law, right? So basically the pressure needs to scale with the concentration of the oxygen in the water, okay? So the pressure of the oxygen is always the same, right? So it wants to pump in oxygen into the water. So what happens is that once the oxygen reaches to the lowest concentration, if it is not to zero, okay? So for our example, it is still not zero yet. So what that means is the oxygen concentration is going to gradually increase back into the saturated level, all right? So um, basically um, in this way, 
we're still retaining most of the biodiversity, let's say the ecosystem here, while we're discharging our, our wastewater into the river, okay? So we definitely want to make sure that this point doesn't drop to zero because once they drop to zero, all of these lower living organisms cannot live anymore. And there's no way that they can treat more uh, organics in the water and cannot generate oxygen into the water, right? So there's no way that we can um, basically sustain this river water quality anymore. So we want to make sure that this point, what people call this as a critical point, this critical point is always above zero. So this is a major point. Then I would say people will be interested in um, setting up a mathematical equation, right? Because we see that the oxygen is going to decrease and uh, increase back again. Um, actually, people call this feature as the DO sag curve, okay? So it's, a, it's like a sag. So it decrease and then increase back again. So because of this feature here, people would like to um, understand how does the dissolved oxygen concentration decrease and increase, right? Because when they're trying to discharge the wastewater, they want to make sure that something like this happens, not something like uh, oxygen go all the way to zero and then always keep in here, right? All the living things are dead in here because of the, um, basically it, they don't have oxygen in here, right? Um, so that's why we want to use some mathematical methods to understand this process. So um, as I said, there are two major processes determining this, uh, determining this uh, DO sag curve. So first thing is the deoxygenate, deoxygenation. So deoxygenation is just the consumption of the organics, right? So this always happens when there is a, when there is polluted species in the water. So the next process is the reaeration, where the oxygen is being pumped back into the water. Okay, so these two processes are going to determine the mathematical equation here. Um, so that was the uh, schematic diagram, and here I would say it's a more uh, accurate reflection of this DO sag curve. So what happens is that at this mixing point, normally we're going to have a lower uh, dissolved oxygen concentration. Right? And then uh, basically this uh, oxygen concentration is going to decrease until it hits to this critical point. And then the concentration increase back again, right? And we know that it's not going to reach to an infinitely large value because it's limited by this saturation dissolved oxygen concentration, which is around eight to 8.5 gram per uh, milligram per liter, okay? So now we can set up a, try to set up a mathematical equation. So uh, instead of setting up the equation that's dependent on DO, let's uh, try to use the equation that describes this term called the deficit, okay? So this is, the full name is an oxygen deficit. So the oxygen deficit is basically the DOS minus DO. Okay, the DOS is the saturation oxygen concentration, and the DO is the oxygen concentration. So basically, the higher the oxygen deficit, the lower the uh, DO concentration, right? And now let's assume that this water flow is a plug flow reactor, it's a PFR. So basically, it's just flowing at a single direction, right? And there's no mixing along the flow direction. So there's only mixing across the flow direction. So what we can do is basically, the, uh, if we set up a differential equation for the oxygen deficit, then dd dt is going to be determined by the uh, deoxygenation and reaeration. Okay, so the deoxygen, deoxygenation is going to consume more oxygen, right? If it consumes more oxygen, then that's going to increase the oxygen deficit. So what that means is that 
uh, it's going to be a positive term, Kd multiplied by the concentration of the organics, right? The higher the concentration of the organics, the, uh, the faster the deoxygenation, right? And the reaeration basically pump in oxygen. So that's going to decrease this oxygen deficit, right? So what that does is it's going to have a minus sign, Kr multiplied by D. So you see the reaeration is dependent on the oxygen deficit. So uh, you can think of a scenario. Let's say we have the water under the saturation point, okay, under this point. So if it's under this point, what that means is that the, the, the oxygen deficit is going to be zero. And then also at this time, the rate of the reaeration is also going to be zero because you don't have any deficit. There's no way you can dissolve more oxygen inside, right? And then the higher the, uh, the uh, oxygen deficit, let's say if the deficit is equal to 8.5 milligram per liter, then you are going to have the largest reaeration rate. So that's why we can have this differential equation here. And further, um, for this L here, when we introduce the BOD, we mentioned that L is equal to L0, uh, one minus exponential, or, or basically the, uh, the organics concentration is just going to be L0 exponential of minus KT, right? Just remember the uh, concentration of the organics, it just decreases exponentially, right? So basically we can plug in these terms into the equation here. You can see that this is just a function of D, right? The, the oxygen deficit. So basically this is going to be our, uh, differential equation. So dd dt equal to kd l minus krd, okay? So again, the d here is the oxygen deficit. It's just calculated by the saturation dissolved oxygen concentration minus the um, minus dissolved oxygen concentration in the river, right? And uh, further, the t is time, right? Kd is the rate constant for the deoxygenation. L is the organics concentration remaining in the water, right? And Kr is the reaeration rate. So the reaeration rate um, basically determines how fast the oxygen is getting into the water, right? Let's say this is the water, this is the oxygen. So you can imagine that basically the higher the velocity, if the velocity of the water is higher, um, then you're going to have more turbulence of the water, right? If there's more turbulence, you have more surface area to get in contact with the oxygen. So then this rate, this Kr uh, is going to increase. And if you have a very deep water, let's say the, the uh, river is very deep in here. So the deeper you have, then the, the smaller the, this uh, rate will, will be, right? Because if you have a very, thin water, then you're also going to generate more turbulence to get more oxygen inside. So that's why people normally use this equation to calculate what is the reaeration rate. You can see that it's square, proportional to square root of the river velocity divided by the height or the depth of this river, okay? And then again, the D here is the oxygen deficit, All right? It's the same thing here. So, um, as we said, the L is calculated by um, this exponential term. So that's already solved. So um, then basically we just have this differential equation as a function of the uh, oxygen deficit. And there's a way to solve this out. So the only unknown here is just the initial condition. What happens at T equal to zero, right? So the T at time equal to zero, then the uh, oxygen deficit, and then the organics concentration is just at this mixing point, right? If you just uh, consider that uh, river water flowing by, we have this uh, wastewater going by, right? So at time e equal to zero, this is just the uh, physical mixing condition, right? So uh, basically this initial condition of the D is calculated by basically dA equal to dOS minus dOA, right? 
So DO is the uh, dissolved oxygen after mixing. And then that can be calculated by this uh, physical mixing condition. So you have the flow rate of water, uh, dissolved oxygen of the water, right? And then flow rate of the river and dissolved oxygen of the river. So I think the water, W here means the wastewater, right? And, the, and then divide that by the um, mixed flow rate of the wastewater and the river water. So the same thing for the organics. The, the organics concentration in the beginning has the equation like this, okay? So it's also a physical mixing of the organics concentration in the wastewater and the river water. So I will skip the derivation for this uh, differential equation. I think the textbook have, has it. And if you have taken the um, differential equation or the calculus before, you should also have this equation uh, in your textbook. Okay, so we have this equation to determine what is the oxygen deficit as a function of time, right? As it flows by along the, uh, along the direction of the river. Um, so this is a uh, example problem that's using this DO sag curve property. Um, so I would say that, <clears throat> please go over this question here. We can discuss more in our next class. And you also have a few homework problems on this problem, right? So finally, it's the critical point, right? So we're interested in the critical point. So that's why we also have these equations to uh, describe what is a condition at this critical point. Uh, so that's all for this class. We can discuss more um, following this after the class, uh, in our next class, all right? Um, that's all for this class.